So we have this big list of different types of unprotected areas, and now I'm going to go through some examples of these. Um, one is military land, um, and this is something that you often don't think of as having conservation value. And I want to preface this by saying this is none of these are saying that all areas of these type are have conservation value. Um, the point is that some of the lands in these categories do have conservation area, and we shouldn't discount them and not do any conservation work on them. Um, we should try and incorporate them when it's feasible. Sometimes it's not going to be feasible. So things like um, places where there are a lot of buildings that are part of military land, that might not be part of our conservation work. But the military owns a lot of land that can be used for training exercises and things like that, and they um, do do conservation on some of those properties. Not all of them again, but some of them. So the U.S. Department of Defense manages 11 million hectares. The White Sands Missile Range is about the same size as Yellowstone National Park. So if we could do conservation on a small proportion of that, that could have a big difference. There is some habitat damage, but much of it functions well for wildlife. Um, the military has been increasing spending for Endangered Species Act listed species by 45% from 2003 to 2012 um, to about $73 million. Um, so here's an example. Eglin Air Force Base um, is doing uh, a decent amount of um, endangered species work. Eglin Air Force Base is located on the panhandle of Florida, right here, right up against the Gulf of Mexico. And it has red cockaded woodpeckers, as well as flatwood salamanders, um, both of which are listed under the Endangered Species Act. And they have been actively managing the habitat and working with the Fish and Wildlife Service um, to help conserve them on the Eglin Air Force Base. In fact, a lot of the herpetologists I know are like itching to get onto Eglin Air Force Base because they have a lot of really rare um, amphibian and reptile species that um, are seem to be doing well on Eglin Air Force Base and not as well in lots of other places. So unprotected forest is a big category. Some forestry practices can maintain species diversity and ecosystem services, um, particularly um, if they involve selective logging, which means that you only take a few trees at a time, and or long cutting cycles. And so that means that you let the forest develop for a long period of time, and then hopefully you're cutting it in smaller patches so that um, any animals displaced by cutting um, can move to a nearby forest or that you're not blinking out large, large tracks all at once. Um, even many of species of megafauna can tolerate selective logging. So this includes things like gorillas, chimpanzees, and elephants. Forestry practices can actually benefit some species by creating early successional habitats. So if we let all the areas um, turn into mature forest, things that need shrubs um, and more open space are not going to do as well. So by having more different kinds of ecosystems, sometimes forestry practices can actually benefit these species. So that's why if you visit some um, refuges or national parks, there may be some selective cutting to manage specifically for um, these early successional species. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about some work um, that I've done. Um, so this is part of my um, dissertation to get my um, PhD, my doctorate. And I worked on these large-scale habitat manipulations looking at forestry practices and how they affect amphibians. So what we did um, was we had these large plots um, where we did clear cutting and we did two different types of clear cutting. We did a clear cut um, where we left the dead wood on the ground. So CWD here stands for coarse woody debris. We left it on the ground and then we had a plot uh, where it was removed. And we had five replicates of these big circles um, in Missouri, where I was working, but they did the exact same experiment in um, South Carolina and also in Maine so that we could look at how the effects of forestry practices might vary um, among these different regions in the United States. And the idea was to ask how forestry practices impact amphibians. 
and we trapped amphibians and looked at them. Um, but we also collected some data on small mammals and reptiles. So this is a summary of all of that. And this is, if it's zero, it means that there was no difference between that forestry practice and the control. Um, if it goes this way, that means there was a negative effect. And if it goes this way, there was a positive effect. And all of these effects are all on amphibians. Um, and you'll note here that the um, white bar and the stripy bar um, are both are two different kinds of clear cuts, but the black bar is a partial cut, meaning that 60% um, of the trees were cut, but the rest were left standing. Um, and so you can see here that there were a lot of negative effects on amphibians from forestry practices, and the few positive effects that were found were all these black bars, um, which is the partial cut. So the, the partial cutting was much better than clear cutting or cutting all of the forest at once. And so this summarizes that, where the negative effects from the clear cuts were larger than from the partial cut. Now this is some of the work I did. I wanted to compare in the same plots what happened to small mammals and what happened to reptiles. Um, and so this graph shows the number of captures of short-tailed shrews, which are these guys, um, in these different um, categories. And so this is the control forest, um, so uncut forest, actually had the lowest captures per year. And the clear cut with the low amount of wood had the highest captures per year and the high wood and partial cut were intermediate. So this showed that doing forestry practices was better for short-tailed shrews than it was for not cutting the forest at all. I also looked at reptiles, and so this looks at um, the top graph is um, members of the genus Plesiodon, which are these pretty skinks that have bright blue tails when they're babies. And then I also looked at um, Scalabrus undulatus, which is the eastern fence lizard, which also has this beautiful blue um, on the males. Um, and what we see is similar, that the reptiles are doing very well and prefer the clear cuts, um, both the skinks and the fence lizards. Um, similar to what was found with the shrews. So we're seeing that reptiles and small mammals do better with some forestry practices as opposed to just completely leaving the forest alone, whereas amphibians would prefer the forest to be left standing. Other categories um, of unprotected areas include unprotected grasslands, like the edges of roads and power line right-of-ways, um, which represent about 2 million hectares in the United States. So there is a lot of land in just next to um, roads and power line right-of-ways. Um, and these don't always facilitate conservation, but if they're managed properly, they can be good, at least for pollinators. Um, and the best scenario is if they're infrequently mowed and no herbicides are used, um, as well as if they're not seeded with invasive species. If that happens, not so good. But you can get good development of native species um, if you take these practices into account. Um, monarch butterflies are something that particularly benefit from this. Um, I don't know if any of you know, but monarchs are migratory. I'm sure a couple of people know about this. They have a really interesting migration pattern where they don't, as adults, migrate all the way um, north and all the way south. They do it generationally. So um, they overwinter in Mexico on these huge trees. So you can see all these, they look like leaves. Those are all monarch butterflies. And this is where they spend um, the winter down here in Mexico. And then those butterflies, adult butterflies, will fly up north into Texas. They will lay their eggs on milkweed, which you can see a picture of milkweed here. Um, the adults will die. The eggs turn into caterpillars and um, t eventually turn into adult butterflies, which will fly farther north um, through the spring into the early summer. They'll again lay eggs on milkweed. Um, those eggs will develop into caterpillars. 
which will become adults, which will fly farther north um, to lay eggs on milkweed. And then the cycle is repeated back the other way every year. And so there's multiple generations needed to conduct this um, migration pattern. Um, and they've tracked these butterflies um, by tagging them with little stickers um, so that they can identify where they last were. But they're also using their chemical signature using stable isotopes um, to also track this migration. Um, and so we get monarch butterflies here in Louisiana, and we will get them in the spring and in the fall when they come back down. And so having this native milkweed available um, in as many places as possible is going to be helpful for monarch butterflies. And um, monarchs have been declining dramatically in recent years, so there's a lot of impetus to try and conserve monarch butterflies. Um, and so this shows some of that data. This is the monarch population in millions. And so it used to be regular for it to be somewhere between uh, 290 to almost 700 million monarch butterflies. Um, but recently, we've been struggling to get um, anywhere close to 200. We haven't had 200 million um, in a year, in a while. And it's been it's not been getting much better um, since the end of this graph. Um, so this shows these essential plants that monarchs need um, to lay their eggs on. Um, some different types of milkweed. So we have butterfly weed, swamp milkweed, white milkweed, common milkweed, and the green antelope milkweed. Um, there are other species of milkweed that are um, non-native. Those are not good for monarch butterflies. So there has been a project through the Monarch Joint Venture where you can certify a little patch of land as having good habitat for monarchs. And you plant some native milkweed and you can um, register your property. And so this is a way that you can do conservation almost anywhere because a milkweed plant is very small. And so you can have them in power line right-of-ways where there's a gas pipeline. You can, they've done it at senior living communities, at schools, you can do your backyard, and um, even agricultural areas um, are here. These are all gardens. Um, but this is a way you can do conservation anywhere, and the monarchs really need it. So um, this is a really great um, project that illustrates that idea of um, reconciliation ecology, but also um, conservation on unprotected grasslands.